morning. Uh, today's reading will be from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 7, taken from the New International Version. That's Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 7. Now faith in confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith he was commended as righteous. When God spoke well of his offerings, and by faith Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. I promise you I'm not running out to the exit door. I don't know what it is, but this table, when I preach or teach a class, I feel very comfortable. So, good morning, church. Uh, we are in a sermon series called uh, Grow Into Maturity. And uh, today we'll be talking about an important topic uh, that is essential to our growth with our relationship with God. And the point of our lesson this morning will be is, how can we please God through our faith? And our objectives this morning will be to distinguish the difference between what biblical faith is and what secular faith is. And secondly, how can we practically uh, grow so that we can please our God. Uh, how can we grow so that we can please God through our faith? So first off, let's look at what secular faith is. Uh, faith is something we often hear. Many of us put a lot of faith in things, whether it's intentional or not. Let me give you a definition of what secular faith is, right from the Webster's Dictionary. And it is a firm belief in something for which there is no proof or complete trust and loyalty in something or someone. I'm going to give you some examples. Many of you here drive, right? We all drive a vehicle. And if you have a reliable vehicle, you have faith that will get you from point A to point B. We hear the expression, uh, I have faith in you. Maybe you're at a job, or you play for a, a, a sports team, and somebody says to you, I have faith in you to perform this job. I have faith in you to lead this team. Many citizens like you and I uh, put a lot of faith in the hands of our government officials. Uh, which leads me to a, to a, to a story of Chernobyl. Um, it, it turns out to be one of the worst nuclear disasters to ever happen and occurred on April 26, 1986 in the Chernobyl nuclear power plant near the town of Prepriet in Ukraine. Now a test was to be performed on the reactor as was the custom of the Soviet Union. And so what happens is the Soviet Union puts people in charge to perform this test in a safe manner. 
Many men were in charge, but mainly the chief engineer was Anatoly Detlitov. I hope I didn't butcher his name. But Anatoly uh, had a little bit of arrogance about him, and he wanted to decrease the power of the reactor while the test was being, being performed to a level that was unsafe. Many of his team uh, tried to convince him to not do that. And uh, he, he just ignored the advice of his team and went ahead and did it. And uh, we know that, um, you know, an explosion happened. Now, many people in that town were sound asleep. They had faith that people were going to do their jobs and perform the tests in a safe manner. Only to be awakened by a devastating explosion that would cause many lives even until today. Many people still suffer from this uh, explosion. A lot of children die who were born in that area. Um, now, that's an extreme example of how putting our faith in people gone terribly bad. And now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's wrong to put faith in people. But I'm sure there are many other examples of how putting a lot of faith in someone or something has, um, other than God, has let us down. If you're just like me, uh, I'm sure you've experienced that. Now, I want to move on to what is biblical faith? What does the Bible have to say? Uh, and we hear that word so often in the Bible. Well, the Greek word is pistis. And it is mentioned 278 times in the ESV version of the Bible. What does pistis mean? And I think we don't need to go very far. We, we, um, Hebrews 11.1 1 gives us a fantastic uh, definition of what faith is. And it says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And the two words that stood out for me is assurance and conviction. And I wanted to give you a definition of both of those words. Um, assurance. It means being certain in the mind. You're 100% certain. There's no doubt. You know what you believe in. That's assurance. Conviction, on the other hand, it's kind of similar. It's a strong persuasion or belief. And so you combine those two. Um, so we, we need to have persuasion, uh, conviction and belief in God and the faith of the Bible. Paul in Romans 8.24 reminds us for this idea. He says, For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Many of us here are sitting today waiting for the second coming of Christ with patience. Because we know that he has given us many examples to believe that he is coming back. Now the Bible is not asking us to take a blind leap of faith. This isn't a Hollywood story or a fictional story. And it's just simply have faith in it and see what happens later. No, we have... God is asking us to have faith in him due to the overwhelming evidence that is stated in Romans 1-2. You know, you just go outside. Look at outside. Look at God's creation. Look at the things he has created, like us humans. Um, as many of you know, uh, we've just experienced, we've just had a little boy, Hakim, and um, we've gone through pregnancy now once, and so... Going through that process right from the beginning all the way up until now when he was born and growing, it's really hard to come out and say that there, a God doesn't exist. Biblical faith is not a bare belief or an intellectual understanding, but rather a willingness to believe, trust, rely, and cling to. And, and I think this is what God wants us to, to, to be like, is to trust to believe Him and to cling on to Him. Biblical faith gives us a bright future. We don't have time this morning to read Romans, uh, I'm sorry, Revelations 21. But the promise of the new Jerusalem is only made available to those who have faith in the God of the Bible. You know, you think about there will be no more tears, there will be no more sleeping. What an awesome thing to ponder about. As Christians, we have a bright future. And I say this again, it's only made available through the God of the Bible. Now, I wanted to, there are a lot of stories in the Bible that I could have picked 
there's a lot of, uh, from our reading this morning, we've seen many who've uh, demonstrated their faith. But one story in particular that always stands out to me is found in Matthew 8, verses 5 to 10. And it's the centurion's faith that I want to talk about this morning. So again, that's Matthew 8. I'll be reading from verses 5 to 10. When he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man. Am I good? Okay. Uh, for I too am a man under authority, with, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I love that story for so many reasons. Let's dig deep into it. A centurion, if you know uh, anything about centurions, is they were an official for the Roman army. And what's interesting about centurions is that the Bible speaks very highly of them on seven other occasions in the New Testament. Uh, Jews had many reasons to dislike centurions. Why? Well, because they worked for the Romans. Yet, this did not stop, uh, this did not stop the centurion from approaching Jesus. His attitude towards his slave was different than any other. Uh, back then, a, a master had every right to disown his slave or abandon his slave if they were useless to them. But this centurion did not do that. He, he wanted to help him and he wanted to heal him. This centurion understood Jesus' spiritual authority. He knew that Jesus could heal without being present, which I think is so awesome. Now, Jews considered Gentiles' homes were unworthy to enter. The centurion assumed Jesus would think the same. That's why he said to him, I'm not worthy for you to enter my home. However, Jesus did not feel that way. He was willing to go and enter his home. I love this part uh, of this story as Jesus marveled at his faith. And he said, no one in Israel had I found such faith. What an awesome compliment, isn't it? Can you imagine Jesus marveling at your faith? And Jesus granted the centurion's request and healed his servant instantly. Now, when you read that story and hear Jesus describe the centurion's faith as great, I don't know about you, but I am motivated to try and be a better faithful servant for God. I need to be humble and acknowledge that we can improve in certain areas so that one day Jesus may say to us, well done, my faithful servant. I want to move on to my next point of my lesson. How do we practically grow our faith muscle? And I wanted to give credit to Mike Mazzalanco for this idea of, um, uh, for this illustration of comparing our faith to our exercise. Uh, I thought it was really fitting to share with you uh, with our lesson this morning. And uh, now when it comes to exercise, most of us enjoy the benefits, right? We know that exercise produces good health. It gives us a good emotional boost. Uh, it prevents weight gain. But not many enjoy the process. It's painful. It's boring. It's costly. I think my friend Chad's been getting, getting me to go to the gym for so many years now. I still haven't. Um, when we don't focus on working our faith muscle, when times of trouble occur, what happens? We get anxious. We start to feel uneasy. Anxiety creeps in. And maybe from that point on, doubt starts to creep in. We start to, to doubt God. We start to doubt His Word. We start to doubt His existence, maybe. We start to become a fear. We become afraid. 
And to certain extents, we abandon God as a whole. We walk out on God. On the other hand, when we are active and exercising our faith muscle, in times of trouble, we can withstand the trials and testing and remain faithful to God. In order for us to commit to the right exercise program, I think we need to draw from Jesus, who I believe provided the best spiritual exercise program ever known to men. And I'm going to draw to Mark 4, verses 35 to 40. That's Mark 4, verses 35 to 40. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him, and a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat. So the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? So, one of the things you'll notice about Jesus' exercise program is he brings his disciples into the storm. Jesus starts off his faith-building program by bringing them into the storm. Many of his disciples were experienced fishermen. This wasn't something new for them. This, is, this wasn't a new territory. Now, the severity of the storm was beginning to frighten his disciples. Now, this was an actual storm that the disciples went through. But it can be used as a metaphor uh, for us in many different storms we face in our lives. God tests us or brings us into trials that go beyond our strength and courage. Now, we all have different things that make us afraid or test us beyond our, our courage. For some, it's the loss of a job. Others, it's serious illness. And some people just do not like being alone. It's necessary for us to experience trials and tests so we can, so we can exercise our faith muscle. This is one of the first steps that the Lord brings us into. Secondly, Jesus allows the storm to test his disciples. The apostles began to sense danger, and Jesus allowed them to go through it. You know, the, from that story, it tells us that Jesus was asleep, but he could have easily woken up before they even approached him and, and stopped the storm right there and then. But he allowed them to go through it. The apostles wake Jesus up by asking him, Do you not care that we are perishing? And what's interesting about that is their, their, um, their fear of perishing outweighed their, uh, their faith in Jesus. They were so afraid that they might die right there and then, even though they were with Jesus. Sometimes we get so occupied with the condition of the storms. How long? When is it going to be over? But maybe instead, our attitude should be different. We should look at it as an opportunity to grow our faith muscle, to exercise our faith muscle. God allows the storms of life to test your faith. The goal of this is to see, do you really believe in Him, or are you just giving Him lip service? Each person will be, di uh, will be tested in different areas of their lives. As I mentioned, family, health, finances, even our faith. And speaking from experience, expect growing pains. I'm sure you've experienced this. Anger, frustration, impatience, and sometimes doubt. But when we are in the midst of the storm, do not give up on God. Just like the disciples, they did the right thing by going to Jesus. It's part of Jesus' faith building program. Our goal should be to face any storm life throws at us. Because we should have a faith solid enough that regardless of the storm, we can face it head on. Scripture promises that God is in control of all things. If sometimes you feel hopeless, if you feel discouraged, I'm going to leave you with some scriptures and keep them in mind as you go through the storms of life. 
I want to remind us this morning that God is over creation. In Job 42 verse 2, it says, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. God is over the affairs of the nations. Job 12, 23. He makes the nations great, then destroys them. He enlarges the nations, then leads them away. God is over human life. Job 14, 5. Since his days are determined, and the number of his months is with you, and you have appointed his limits that cannot be passed. God chooses who succeeds and who doesn't. Luke 1, 52. He has brought down the rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. Sometimes a test or a storm or a trial may seem so large for us that we cannot handle. But I just want to remind you that for God, there's nothing too big for Him. He created this whole entire universe. And I'm sure he can help us get through any storm. Lastly, from, from Jesus' faith building program, uh, he leads us into calm waters. For the apostles, they were eyewitnesses to Jesus calming the storm. Just remember, each storm will pass, will pass by at some point. The ones who persevere uh, the ones who persevere with Christ are the ones who can expect the most growth. Trusting Jesus through the storms of life creates in us a peaceful inner spirit that will help us to be assured when raging waves are around us. Just like for the apostles, he will lead us into calming still waters. I just want to recap what we talked about. I know there was a lot said there. We talked about the difference between uh, biblical and secular faith. We also talked about the story of the centurion and his great faith and how it was demonstrated. Um, we also talked about practical ways as to how we can grow uh, our faith so that we can please God. And lastly, I want to leave you with one last takeaway. And it is a, you may have heard this, uh, it, it is a letter of a minister who was uh, martyred for the, for the cause of Christ in Zimbabwe. Uh, it doesn't, he doesn't have a name or nothing, so uh, the, the letter, um, it says commitment, and the title of the letter is My Colors. And it reads, do you know what it means to sacrifice? Read this statement by a young African pastor. I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of his and I won't look back. Let up, slow down, back away or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm done and finished with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tamed visions, mundane talking, cheap living, and dwarf goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right, or first, or tops, or recognized, or praised, or rewarded. I live by faith, lean on his presence, walk by patience, lift by prayer, and labor by the Holy Spirit's power. My face is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven. My road may be narrow, my way rough, my companions few, but my guide is reliable, and my mission is clear. I will not be bought, compromised, deterred, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice or hesitate in the presence of the adversary. I will not negotiate at the table of the enemy. 
ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I chose to read that letter to you because I don't know how you feel after hearing that, but I sense somebody who is totally assured and convicted by Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross. When I read this, I hear someone who totally was sold out for Jesus, who loved Jesus to the point of even dying. I hope to leave you with some thoughts. And if you're someone here who's thinking about giving your life to Jesus and beginning your faith journey so that you can please God, I ask you to speak to the elders, speak to Jay, or anybody in this congregation who may help you with this decision. I thank you for your time. Let's stand as we sing and remain standing for the uh, closing prayer as Ray leads us. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you 